I invite you, Governor, I invite the people on the budget to do me a favor. Come. Come with me. Come to a house. Come to a group home. See who the children are. Talk to the people that work there. You're going to get an earful of dedicated people, our direct care service professionals. I want to ask you, how many people here are going to tell your children, hey, listen, when you grow up, I want you to be a direct caregiver? Are you kidding me? The lowest job, the hardest, the, hardest, the most difficult. You're dealing with human dignity and respect. You have to be a special person. And I just don't understand if we don't pay people like this. Where are our values? Are they upside down? Are we talking about dollars here and minimum wage here and the difficulty of training and the obligation and responsibility? As far as taking care of him, I'm it. My husband is gone. My brother uh, died in last, uh, this past January, and uh, he used to help me. And um, I have sisters, but they have grandchildren and lives of their own, so they can't really watch him, so I am it. My daughter does try to help me as, as much as possible, but she's 30 and she needs to have a life. I can't, I can't put that on her. And Nicholas is violent. He's incredibly hard to handle. He hits me on a daily basis. He pushes me. Not that he means to, it's just the way he is. He's just a nervous Nelly. And uh, he's really difficult. He's a very difficult kid to handle. He needs 24 hour supervision. He can never, ever be left alone. He has no concept of danger. He can't read, he can't write, he can't dial 911. He, need, he functions on the level of a two or three year old. We've come a long way and we can start to slip back into where you're more house, uh, warehousing individuals than giving them a, 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 a life, a good life in the community. Uh, it takes funding to put people in the community. You know, you just don't bring people out into the community it, it, by truckloads. They have to be small little groups and, and it, with adequate staff so that they can be integrated into the community. And, and that funding cuts jeopardize that, po that possibility in the future. We were blessed with a special child. And you know, he was almost four years old. Beautiful baby. He was so good. He doesn't speak, he didn't cry, and he smiled. And all of a sudden, my wife, who was a nurse, and a very loving, loving person, said there's something wrong. And the, the pediatrician said, well, he'll outgrow it, it'll come in time, he'll be, maybe he's a late developer. But Ellen knew. So we went to the doctor. He had a club foot, developmentally disabled, profoundly retarded, couldn't speak, and couldn't cry. What's best for us to do? I'm the mother of a 43-year-old man who, interestingly, was diagnosed with autism at his first birthday by my sister, uh, who, was a, who was a physician. She's deceased now. But it was unheard of to, to identify children with autism 42 year, 43 years ago, I mean 42 years ago, at his first birthday party. And I remember her asking me if I knew what autism was. And at the time I was a PhD candidate, so I was no dummy. I had never heard of it. I have not been able to place him because he needs a med more, not a nursing home, he needs a facility that has trained personnel, nurses, you know, more more than just um, a residential manager. And um, I, nothing has come up once something has come up. I, since my husband has died, I got fired when my husband died from my from my job for taking too much time off to try to, you know, get things settled in my home after, you know, since I had nobody to care for Nick. Cannot work since because I have nobody to take care of him. He's not gone long enough hours for me to work. Well, uh, you know, uh, many people don't even know what Willowbrook, especially today, don't know what Willowbrook was, but Geraldo Rivera at the time was a young reporter and he went into this the institution called Willowbrook that housed thousands of uh, children and adults with developmental disabilities on Staten Island. And uh, he was sort of 
he was allowed in you know, on the QT, and he filmed what was absolutely hor horrible. I just was recently with uh, in a program where a, a, a man who worked at Willowbrook described what it was like to work there, that the individuals that were, he, they were caring for were 30, 40 people half naked in one large room that they locked the door with three staff people. He described how they were bathed, Dave. It was absolutely stunning. He said they would line the people up and one person would wet them down, another person would soap them, another person would rinse them. And then they would rummage and try to get some little rag to put on them that was not even clothing, really. Uh, it was absolutely horrible. And with, after that um, expose, you know, Willowbrook was <clears throat> closed. People were deinstitutionalized. Uh, later on, Carrie, uh, Governor, then Governor Carey, signed a Willowbrook consent decree, which described how uh, institutions would be um, uh, emptied. We're still on that process. I, if I'm, if my memory serves me correctly, there are, I believe, four institutions still open with much diminished populations, and those are all going to be closed. I believe the target date is 2015. Uh, so subsequent governors, including Governor Cuomo, um, this current Governor Cuomo, uh, Andrew Cuomo, have you know, made it a, a policy or pledge that they will close all of the institutions. Willowbrook was just horrendous, and it was just a, it was an atrocity that anybody would be treated like that. And yes, things are much better now. However, I will say that I, since I am a nurse, I do I am in contact with people who do work in um, residential facilities, and I will say. I hate to say this, but when you pay somebody six or seven or eight dollars an hour to take care of these kids, you're not going to get the cream of the crop. And I will say, as a mother, I would not do it for that amount of money. These kids need people who are who are educated to to take care of them, to understand what they're going through, and they need to make more money. They are so difficult to handle. And when you have a special child in those days in the 50s, uh, your family doctor said the best thing you can do is have your child go to a facility that will be able to care for them, they'll feed them and clothe them, and they will provide for them. And what you have to do in order to maintain stability in your family is to let these people take charge or control of the life of your child. Now you know any loving parent how difficult it is give somebody else a responsibility that is yours, that you cherish and love and appreciate your child and you want to provide for that child. To give that ability of taking care of your own child to somebody else is a very painful, devastating experience. When you go there, when you went there, they said, you know, we'll take care of your child, but you stay away here from us for six weeks because we have to have this child to be able to adapt to his new environment. And he was 21 and aged out of the education department and went into the state care, I was told by Medicaid that anything I got from now on was a gift. Some of the changes, I don't want to seem like a naysayer, some of the ideas like something called self-direction and self-determination where the individual with a disability and his family run the show, they get a budget and they hire people and they and uh, they have to partner with a, a, an, an agency, but they hire people and they supervise the people and they determine the program. Well, that is a very good thing, excellent thing for those for whom it's appropriate. But uh, you were just talking about the woman you went to high school who can't work because her son is so difficult. That, that's a situation like that. You're not going to find a parent being able to find staff and supervise staff and develop a program. A circle of friends, they call it. Well, I'm sorry. You're just not going to find the circle of friends who are going to deal with a six foot three, violent, large man. Doesn't happen. Not going to happen. 
So for those individuals for whom group homes have been the, a lifeline and have it, it, the group homes of oh, Rico's life in his group home, he goes out at night. He, he might out might be to Seven Eleven, but he's out in the community. And he loves music, and the workers there who are into uh, music, they'll go to a, a concert, and they'll actually hold up their phone and tape it and bring it back and show it to him. Um, they'll, they'll ask me if I, wanna, if I can buy Rico a ticket to a show. Um, the group homes are wonderful, but uh, and now the idea, uh, OPWDD, which is the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, the state agency, and on the federal level, they're pushing for families to keep their adult disabled child at home and to care for them in, in their own home with supports and services. And as I said, for those families um, for whom that's appropriate, it's great. It didn't exist before. You know, new things and new opportunities are always a positive thing. But let's not get rid of the things that were working for families who either due to socioeconomics um, are unable to stay home and supervise and, and have their own little unique individualized program. Even in the conference committees, I asked a simple question. Governor, people on the budget committee, have you ever fed a person who couldn't feed themselves? Have you changed a diaper? Do you know how to do a feeding tube to a child who can't be used, can't feed himself? Are you aware of how difficult life is when you're challenged? How difficult is it for your families? What happened to our child, Ricky? Six weeks he was there, and when we went there, or when Ellen went there, basically, and she saw her child who weighed 50 pounds when he was there to start, he was down to under 25 pounds. He lost half his body weight, looked like a concentration victim, he was bent over, his tongue was black. What we heard and what we found out was the residents were feeding him because he could not feed himself and wasn't being fed, and he. He just looked horrible. So, of course, Ellen took this child back and brought it to our pediatrician. The pediatrician cried. That's how devastating Ricky was. He looked like a victim from a concentration camp. And Ellen, who was probably the most loving person that you could ever meet in this world, brought Ricky back to good health. And then what happened is we're going to have to do what we can to find a resource or a facility that would take better care of our children, especially of our own child, Ricky. Well, when my son had his breakdown in 97, when he was 15, um, there was, uh, we suspected, because he changed so dramatically, we did suspect that he was abused. Um, subsequently, of course, there was no way to prove it because I was told by lawyers that, um, it would be his word against somebody who was allegedly normal and you know he's not gonna be able to really testify on his behalf but subsequently I will tell you that I did call the state education department and the person that we believe abused him had a very long history of problems within the uh, mentally retarded community and had been kind of roaming from from uh, site to site to site as he got, I guess, caught. Nobody did anything because it's very hard to prove anything legally. However, if you ask me, I would say that he was definitely responsible and something did happen to my son because he changed dramatically from a very lovely, wonderful, loving child to a psychotic person. And I mean, you know, listen, I had limited resources. What could I tell you? There's nothing really you could do because nobody's going to listen to a child like Nicholas. There's no question that the people who live in his group home cannot go out on their own and cannot go out, in, uh, out into the community is what I mean by out in large groups unless they have sufficient staff. So if there are cutbacks 
and the number of staff that are in a, on a given shift are reduced, what's going to happen is people like Rico will be uh, on under house arrest you know, for the crime of being developmentally disabled because he, he literally cannot walk out the door by himself. He couldn't cross that street by himself. He wouldn't look at the traffic properly. Um, if there was a fire, he, he I think he would leave. But he certainly wouldn't know how to call the fire department or what to, and he's, his language is limited. He wouldn't even know what to say. So, um, yes, I think th the answer is no, I don't think they're going to abandon group homes and push people out of them. But what I do think is that the system might reduce the funding and that would have an impact on the quality of life that he now has, which I believe is a very nice quality of life. And, the way and one that one that he deserves. I mean, as a human being. Absolutely. And they, you just don't understand that every every person that I know, almost everyone, almost a hundred percent of these people work two jobs because their pay is so low that they have to work two jobs in order to be able to pay their bills. But there are some of these people that are so dedicated. They're wonderful people who become surrogate parents for the residents that they take care of the children. They become, as I said, like surrogate parents. They love and do the best they can. And yet, we have people that aren't qualified, that don't have that instinct for love and caring, and they have a job. And if they're hired for a job that has control like this, that is stressful and difficult, then we end up with incidents that are very sort of dangerous uh, because of Jonathan's case and many others of abuse and neglect. So I had hearings on this, and in hearings, I had people, for ice. one hearing I had was for eight hours, and we had over 40 different families talking to me about the incidents that have occurred with them or their family members from all over the state of New York. And then we did a little research, and we found out in one year that we had 13,000 incidents of neglect and abuse less than 5% investigated, and not one reported to law enforcement. Now, this is an awakening. These kids need, they're not even kids, they're adults. They need professional people that are paid, compensated for what they do. It's as simple as that. I would not do it myself for that. And I, and I am a nurse. I love kids. I love them. I have a heart. But for $8 an hour, you couldn't get me to... There's no way. There's no way. I wouldn't do it. The money is there. We put it in, in the assembly budget. The Senate put it in, in their budget. Bipartisan. What happened to that money? It was there. Now it isn't there. And when you talk about negotiations, it's very upsetting. I spoke to every, every senator, every assemblyman, every Democrat, every Republican. You know it. We're all in favor of it. Well, let our voice now unite together, and let's, the only way we're going to have success is to educate and make the governor aware, make him sensitive to understand, make everybody who's involved sensitive to understand the quality of life, the dignity and respect, and a relief to families. And we have hundreds of thousands of people that are being impacted by these cuts. Their voices have to be heard. By the way, that's an expression that was given to me many years ago. You're the voice of those who have no voice. Well, that's an obligation and responsibility, but now it's ours. You said it, you feel it. God bless you and I thank you. We're one family here. Together, we will have success. And I thank you.